Welcome to the Bella Vista Gardening Program. I'm Jerry Horner, and my guest today is John Zvishlak, and he is the uh, apiculture instructor at the University of Arkansas, Division of Agriculture with the Cooperative, Cooperative Extension Service. And today we're going to be talking about bees and beekeeping, and I'll also be talking about some upcoming an upcoming event and some things that you need to do in your garden in March. It's the time to start gardening. It's the year is starting again. And um, the upcoming event uh, this month for March is the Bella Vista Garden Club's card party. It's a benefit card party and it's going to be at the uh, United Lutheran Church on March 18th from noon to 4. And this is our fundraiser for our Dorothy Wallace scholarships that go to uh, local horticulture students. So we're going to have our good food this year as usual and uh, reservations can be made on our website, bellavistagardenclub.com. Uh, just go to the website and you can um, make your reservations if there's tickets left, so we always sell out. It's a great card party and a good benefit for the scholarship. So, But today we just want to talk to John. Um, he is um, uh, a native Arkans Arkansan and earned his bachelor degree at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. And then he spent a number of years participating in field research and, and pests and, and insect control and so forth. And uh, completed his master's degree at, U at the University of Arkansas. And he works with state um, commercial and hobbyist beekeepers. So we're going to learn about, a lot about beekeeping today and educating uh, people about the importance of honeybees. And uh, his family has. Uh, Walnut Hill honey. They sell honey in Little Rock, which uh, mm -hmm. I love to have local honey. Um, so we just need to find out more about bees from John here. Good morning, Jerry. Good it's morning. a pleasure to join you today. And um, we need to talk about the collapse of the beehives, and, and you know, um, everyone seems to be really concerned about that, at least in um, the gardening community. We all are concerned because bees are such um, good pollinators. If we didn't have bees, we wouldn't have too much of the food we have on our table now. So mm -hmm. um, well, We've been concerned about the decline of honeybees and all pollinators for several years now. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, in a lot of places in the industrialized world especially, the, the bee populations have, have really been going down. Right. And it's not really one single cause. There's a lot of different factors that go into it. Probably our most important enemy of the honeybee are exotic parasites that have been accidentally moved here from Asia. They're, they're in exotic parasitic mites. They attack the bees, oh. they, they uh, spread diseases, and they weaken the bees. And they're in just about all the honeybee colonies. All of them? Yeah. So, they're, so they're, there's they're, no way you can get rid of them. Well, we can, we can keep point. their levels down, but it, it's very challenging for the, the beekeepers. Oh, wow. And so uh, that's probably our number one concern. Uh -huh. uh, other factors include habitat loss. Uh, there's a lot of the wild areas uh, where the, the flowers historically have been are, are disappearing, getting paved well, over and mowed down. Right, and, and then we're bringing in a lot of, you know, um, plants from other countries instead of the mm -hmm. native plants. Uh, well, honeybees are actually to. from the old world, right. so they're not native to the they new world. Adapt. And so honeybees really love a lot of the plants from the old world as well. But we have a lot of native bee pollinators uh, here as well. We've got okay. about 200 species of native bees in Arkansas. Oh my god. Probably goodness. about 4,000 or so species in North America. And so they're all really good pollinators on native plants. Mm -hmm. But honeybees are, are probably our preferred pollinator for large scale agriculture because mm -hmm. you can take one hive of honeybees and it may have 30 or 40, even 50,000 individuals in it. And we can. Wow move that beehive around and we can put it in, in an apple orchard and mm -hmm. you know, we can move it into a, a blueberry farm and, and we can take it from place to place as needed. And so they would just um, pollinate for a day or two and then go back to the hive or how long does it take mm -hmm. to pollinate? Well all the bees field? go back into their hive every at night. Day, every yeah, night. They, they only fly out during the day and so uh, in the evening we can close a hive up when all the uh -huh. bees are back inside and you can put it on a truck and you can take it cross country. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Right now, about half the bees in this country are being moved out to uh, California just to pollinate one crop. Mm. The almond industry has to get about a million and a half bee colonies moved out there wow. 
every spring. They're, they're the first major crop to bloom, so it's a really large endeavor. It's amazing when you um, don't know the, the logistics of all these um, you know, pollinators, but you just think it happens naturally, and it doesn't when they have to move all these hives, hives to the different fields. So. Mm -hmm. But um, the other thing we're concerned about is, is pesticides, too. You know, there's, uh, people get really alarmed about, you know, not using any pesticides. And we're trying, um, you know, in this area to use less and less and, and go back mm -hmm. to native and, and natural, natural pesticides and natural um, control of, of mm -hmm. insects. So, and there's not that many insects that are damaging really to the uh, no, to gardens. The, the percentage of insects that are truly pests is, is very small, right. but on, on large-scale agriculture, it's those few pests that are well adapted to a specific crop, and when we grow that crop in thousands of acres in one place, right. then that pest is going to thrive. Right. And in order to produce food on the scale that we do in this country, it would be very, very difficult to do that without, without the chemical fertilizers and right. the pesticides that right. we use. Well, the, um, the uh, chemicals we use in our garden, if we just follow the uh, label and do it as instructed, we shouldn't have too much problem with the bees then? As long as we are very judicious in our use of, of garden chemicals, mm -hmm. follow the label and, and don't use more than is necessary, don't use it when it's not necessary, right. then we can, we can usually be safe around uh, okay. our beneficial insects. Because I know there's uh, the soaks we use like for the, on the azaleas for the lace bug. I used mm -hmm. it several years in a row and then I didn't have a lace bug, so I thought, well, I'll just not use it for a few years. And I mm -hmm. went several years without it. Mm -hmm. And now I have lace bug again, so I'll probably have to use it again. So, mm -hmm. But once I put that uh, soak on the plant, um, do, how long does that residually um, stay in the pollen? Is it something that uh, would stay there for a long time? Or? It really depends on the dose that's used okay. and, and the particular plant and, and the application. So I can feel safe to use it once in a while if I Once in a while, it. it's probably safe yeah. as long as you're using it according to the label. Right. The, the label on any pesticide is, is the law. Right. And I know there's, um, uh, in California, they talk about the uh, use of chemicals. And I think I had a, a little thing here. It's on the plant itself, on the label, it shows that it was treated with a chemical. So they mm -hmm. have to tell them in California mm -hmm. when plants are treated before you buy them. And mm -hmm. I had no idea that they treated plants before you bought them. Um, I thought, you know, we were the ones putting all the chemicals on after we bought these uh, annuals and, and plants, but mm -hmm. apparently they're doing it at the nursery also. Yeah, so. well, the nurseries are raising thousands of plants in one small location, mm -hmm. so they have a, a much greater potential for pest problems, right. and, and they want to eliminate that while they're raising the plants before they ship them out before to, they get to other to you. dealers. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, as far as beekeeping, I know you do instructions about how to be, how to um, start a hive and and how to take care of bees. Mm -hmm. um, so where do, where would you start if you wanted to um, start a, a beehive and be a beekeeper? Well, you need a beehive to keep the bees in, and you've got to locate some bees, which is easier said than done sometimes. Uh, because honeybees are in very high demand right now, mm -hmm. the interest in beekeeping is, has really been on the rise the last few years. And uh, that's also created a, a shortage of bees uh -huh. for a lot of people. So uh, you, usually we try to reserve your bees early in the year, January, February, and bees will not be ready to, uh, to pick up or be delivered until probably about mid-April. So it's almost like ordering your plants from a nursery. Mm -hmm. You have to order your bees from a beekeeper. You do. You can still get bees even if you get a late start, but you, you will miss out on what we call the nectar flow, the, the period April, May into June when almost all of the wildflowers are out in mm -hmm. bloom and, and the bees really take advantage of all the pollen and nectar to build up their population and uh, store up a lot of honey. Okay. If you don't get your bees started until the midsummer, then a lot of the wildflowers disappear and you would wind up having to, uh, to feed your beehive a lot of sugar syrup just to, oh. to get them through that first year. So you year. can supplement with, uh, mm -hmm. with some things too. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know there's some local um, suppliers mm -hmm. that have um, all the supplies you need. Mm -hmm. So you would need the, bee the honey bees and the hive. 
Mm -hmm. But then you need your um, equipment, like we need your a few suits other tools. And, yeah, most yeah. people like a like to use a bee suit, or at yeah. the very least, a, a bee veil, something that covers the face, right. keep the bees out of your ears and out of your nose and things. Right. Uh, well, I I don't think you could be uh, allergic to bees and he'd be a beekeeper. If no, you're allergic to the bee no, sting, that wouldn't not. be a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if he, and some people have a terrible fear of bees, being stung by bees, so they wouldn't be yeah. a good candidate for mm -hmm. beekeeping. But you know, if you're interested in the honey, which is a great byproduct, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to get out of the hives, it'd be great to have a, mm -hmm. a beehive. Mm -hmm. yeah. a fresh, freshly made honey from your own backyard is just oh, amazing. It is. It, it, there's all the difference in the world between that and the honey you can buy in the supermarket. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like buying a, a homegrown, uh, buying a tomato in the store versus a homegrown right. tomato. It's a world of difference. A world of difference, and it's the same with honey. And now, also with. Um, uh, local honey is that supposed to help with allergies also? Mm, that's, some people claim that it does. Uh, and there's I, any I, research on that? If you there can? has been some, but everybody is different. We've uh -huh. all got different physiology, and people have different allergies. But it's based on the same idea as an allergy shot, where you take a, a small dose of uh -huh. the things that you're allergic to, little at a time, and, and then build, you build up, up your that tolerance. Resistance mm -hmm. and so. A lot of the plants that really bother people's allergies, though, are wind pollinated plants oh. because they produce a lot of pollen. Right. And the the insect pollinated plants produce much less pollen and, mm -hmm. and they actually bother people a lot less. Okay, so once we get our beehives going, mm -hmm. um, what is the maintenance on the beehive? What do you have to do to the beehive? It really it varies started? by season. Uh, we, in the springtime, we have to keep a, a close eye on the, the bees and make sure that they have enough space for the queen bee to lay eggs to produce more bees. And also they need room to put extra honey in there okay. and so sometimes we stack additional boxes on top of a beehive. Yeah, I see those boxes that are stacked. And, so and you just as, have to check and see if they're as, crowded and add a box. As the bees bring more nectar in, we may have to put another empty box on top and they can continue to fill that with uh -huh. nectar. And depending on what part of the state you live in, you might be able to harvest 50 or so pounds of honey off of your hive really? up to maybe 150. This depends oh on where you're located. And how much you know, pollen they have to work with. Mm -hmm. and yeah, honeybees will forage up to three miles away from their hive. Really? So for a tiny little bee, that's a really that's great a distance. That's a long way. That's a long mm -hmm. way. If you, if you do the math, it's about 18,000 acres in a couple of miles around. Oh, my. But, you know, like we, in Bella Vista, we have so few homes, you know, in the woods mm -hmm. um, that I don't know if there's a lot of... Um, of uh, pollen available. It, I guess it would just be the native plants and what's ever in the well, There's a fair amount of native plants. Land. There's also, you know, there's, there's pastures and things around and, and a lot of businesses, landscape and with flowers and, oh. and they keep it irrigated. So this isn't probably the, the best honey producing part of the state, but mm -hmm. it, it's definitely enough for a hobbyist. But you can do a hobbyist, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that 50 pounds is just from one hive. If you have two or three beehives, then oh. it can really add up. Okay, that'd be a lot. Now, how hard is it to get the honey out of the beehives? Is that a, a difficult project to no, get the honey? No. Uh, you have to have a spinner or something? Or? We, we use a machine called an extractor. Uh -huh. uh, first, we, we take the boxes of honey off of the, the beehive, and then when the, when the bees are when they bring the nectar in, they have to remove a lot of moisture from the nectar to, and turn it into honey. Uh -huh. And then they seal up each individual honeycomb cell right. with a little wax lid. Uh -huh. And so when we look at the honeycombs and they're all sealed up, we know that it's ready. Oh, and so we okay. can take those combs out and we use a knife to uncap. So we remove that wax lid from all the cells. We put it down into a machine that spins it around and it extracts the honey. And from there we pour it through a uh, a filter just mm -hmm. to remove the big chunks of wax and, mm -hmm. and other debris and from there it goes straight, straight into the into bottles. The Raw honey is perfectly sterile. It doesn't need to be pasteurized or anything and else. And it'll last forever. It doesn't spoil. Pretty much, yeah. Pretty Eventually much. it'll crystallize but uh -huh. all you have to do is gently warm it in a, a pan it of water and, and it'll reliquify. Back to, back to its original state. Mm -hmm. so that's what's so amazing about honey. It just is a food that just lasts forever almost. So. Mm -hmm. And then um, some people take the wax and make 
candles or mm -hmm. beeswax candles. There's a lot candles. of uses for beeswax. So uh, once you scrape that wax off, you can mm -hmm. also use that um, mm -hmm. to make candles or whatever. Mm -hmm. and you can make a lot of cosmetics, lip balms and hand creams oh, and soaps right. and things from beeswax. There's a lot of different things you can make from the, the beehive. From the, from the wax. So after you clean it off and you spin all the honey out, then you just use reuse that um, Put that back in the hive for them the to refill. The empty honeycomb. We we take those and we set them outside, and the bees lick them clean. Oh really? Yeah. There's always a little bit of honey out there, yeah. and so uh, within an hour they're covered with bees. And then uh, once the bees lick it clean for a few days, we can put it away in storage until next spring, and then we'll put them back on the hive one okay. at a time as needed. As you need as you need to build your hive up. Mm -hmm. oh, it's a lot amazing. of work for the bees to build the honeycombs. Uh, and so if uh -huh. every time we can reuse one, then that's uh -huh. a little bit of an advantage for the bees. They don't have to spend Makes as much effort. Makes it a little easier effort. for them. Yeah, you know, exactly. Help them a little mm -hmm. bit. So, but so if, it, if you have a beehive that's, um, you know, it's just your hobby, how many mm -hmm. hours a week would you have to work with it? About how much time would this take on an average? Mm -hmm. uh, when you first get started, there's a little bit more effort, and there's a, a little more learning curve to get started, mm -hmm. but once the beehive is established, it doesn't really take a lot of effort to keep it going. Maybe a, an hour or so a week. Oh. You, you know, spend your, your Sunday afternoon out with, just with your honeybees. Just kind of checking it to see how yeah, it's Yeah, you doing. check. You, you, you're evaluating the amount of space inside the hive just to mm -hmm. make sure that, that the queen bee has space and that uh, they've got room to store honey. And you're also just evaluating the health of the honeybees. Mm -hmm. Bees uh, can get sick. Uh, we keep an eye on the, the mites, the, the parasites, mm -hmm. uh, the mite spread diseases and, and things like that. So we're generally just making sure that everything looks good. Okay, and then there's um, we can get help from the extension service mm -hmm. uh, locally if we have any mm -hmm. um, issues with our beehive. They can direct us to, mm -hmm. to help yeah, with I, that. I answer questions for the whole state. There's also okay. beekeeping clubs all over the state. There's about 20 different clubs. Right. And uh, there's one here in Benton County. There's one in Washington County. There's one in Carroll County. Oh, okay. There's several in Missouri and Oklahoma. So there's a lot of hobbyist beekeepers around. Okay. And they really have a good network, and uh, a lot of them meet monthly, and they get together and discuss issues. and if any problem or talk mm -hmm. about solutions. Yeah, and, and so it's, they're a wealth of information for uh, new beekeepers to, yeah. to learn from experienced beekeepers, and you can often find a mentor in your neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's several, um, several hobbyists here in Bella Vista. Right. I know the um, Master Gardeners have uh, really promoted beekeeping and have directed us to you know different locations where we can learn about it and I think they've mm -hmm. had some classes mm -hmm. about how to start up a, a, a beehive mm -hmm. and we also have um, sources that I will I'll put that on the Bella Vista Garden Club um, website and that's just bellavistagardenclub.com and I'll be putting on uh, information about sources of equipment and the clubs and we'll just have that under um, uh, gardening information Mm -hmm. And so they can get all that information right off the the uh, website. So, and um, how much how much honey does your company sell in Little Rock then? Uh, we sell out every year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can sell every drop that we produce. Um, we, we we're a pretty small operation. Yeah. We, we just have a handful of hives, and it varies from year to year. But probably several hundred pounds of honey that oh, wow. we can bottle up. Yeah, it's just That's me and my wife and my children. And then you just run that yourself. This well, it's, it's kind of a little little, little hobby, hobby on, on the, the side, side yeah. yeah. But it, it it subsidizes the rest of my my beekeeping addiction. <laughs> okay. Well, I certainly like I said, I really enjoyed your class on um, insects uh, uh, at the Master Gardener oh, thank uh, you. training, and um, but bees are just such a interesting mm -hmm. uh, field. And like I said, there's just so much interest now to try to save the bees and, mm -hmm. and know how important they are. And and uh, I just I haven't been able to identify too many of the bees I have. I just know I'd say, mm -hmm. oh, this looks like a honeybee, mm -hmm. or it looks like a you know a sweat bee or something else. Mm -hmm. So the hunt sweat bees don't give any honey out or no, they don't. But they're they still say, good pollinators they're on good native pollinator, plants. But the mm -hmm. honeybee is the one that really produces the honey. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. so well, I encourage anybody to become a beekeeper if, if they'd like to, and uh, I'm happy to help get them information. Mm -hmm. uh, people that, that want to support bees and, and don't think they're ready to take that step, then I would encourage them to support local beekeepers in their area by mm -hmm. buying local honey from right. local beekeepers and, and help those people to keep a healthy bee population right. here in the area. That would be great. And idea uh, too. plant flowers. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Got to plant those flowers that the bees mm -hmm. like.
That's right. they, they're coming from a long way. Mm -hmm. And you, just because you don't have a, a hive in your garden doesn't mean that you don't have bees coming mm -hmm. from all over. That's so, right. And you could almost do this like as a, a project between neighbors, too. Mm -hmm. Like put it between your your two houses or and then share the, the uh, honey and share the work. Mm -hmm. And you can do it together. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel like you can do it all on your own, mm -hmm. that would be a good thing. Well, thank you, John, for all that information. And we need to also do some inf uh, things in our garden. And in addition to beekeeping, we have to uh, um, sort through the seed packets you have on annuals. And uh, uh, if you have some older packets, they'll still probably be good. You just have to sow them a little generously. <coughs> and be sure you got your beds cleaned out for the year. Um, for getting ready for the the uh, new season, and be sure to have your liriope and your um, your ornamental grasses cut back in March. Usually we do it in February, but if the weather's bad, you can kind of delay that till March. But as soon as you see that little growth coming up on your liriope and and so forth, get those um, trimmed off. In house plants, it's a little too early to put them out. The temperature has to be at least 50 degrees, and um, the it's time to apply the pre-emergent <coughs> for weeds and grasses in your lawn by March 15th. Now, would the pre-emergence uh, have any effect on the bees as far as putting that on your lawn? Um, it's possible. A lot of the herbicides are uh, kind of a general broadleaf herbicide, uh -huh. and they don't affect grasses, but grasses don't benefit bees at all. Okay. So all the dandelions and the clover and, and things like that that people are trying to stop are actually mm -hmm. beneficial to the bees. Right. But the pre-emergent that would keep the seeds from uh, germinating, is, is that a chemical that would affect the bees? Cause no, because the bees would probably not would not come in contact with that. Okay, so um, that's pretty safe for the bees. The, so. the effect it has on bees is the removal of nutrition mm -hmm. from an area. Okay. When, when we create an urban area that's free of all flowering weeds, mm -hmm. then it just becomes a big green desert. To, so they to have nothing to feed on. Yeah, they so. just fly right over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the perennials, um, you can b begin dividing your perennials and fertilize your peonies and wisterias with a little superphosphate um, before they bloom. And you can plant your vegetables um, inside and get them ready to put out in the, uh, in the spring. So the trees and shrubs just keep monitoring your, your, um, your water levels on those. And um, don't forget, don't trim any of your spring blooming bushes or are or shrubs because then you won't have any blooms so you'll have to wait till after they bloom to to trim those so and the Bella Vista Garden Club meeting uh, will in March is going to be on March 23rd is the fourth Wednesday of the month it's going to be at the United Lutheran Church and we always welcome guests um, the program is going to be Lynn uh, Sub Subacto and she's the operator of Morningstar Wildlife uh, Rehabilitation She's going to have some of her special guests at the meeting, so this is going to be an interesting meeting uh, with some of her guests. So we just have a little light lunch in the program, and for more information, you can go to the Bella Vista Garden Club uh, website. And thank you, John, for joining me this month. I'm just um, anxious to maybe try the beekeeping. I'm not sure. I might have to have help with the neighbor, you know, go together on it or something and, until I get started. So, but it's. Uh, it's a great hobby, and it's, it's good for the environment, and, and it's fun to watch those bees um, fertilize everything. So, Well, thanks for inviting right. me. Pollinate everything. So, And I hope you enjoyed the show, and, and tune in next month. And until then, don't forget to stop and smell the roses. <laughs>